So it's such an exciting day, it, and it's always good to be amongst friends. Um, so I want to welcome you to our meeting this mo this afternoon. Um, if anyone in the audience is presenting that we have not met, we want to make sure you get a seat up front. Um, and all our guests, please feel free to chime to sit in. Um, we want to welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming today. And so we're going to get the meeting started with Commission Council Member Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, well, welcome to the Commission on um, Black Girls. And I want to welcome some of our new, or not necessarily new members, but some of our members who may not have had the opportunity to be here for other reasons. They were traveling, et cetera. So I just want to make sure I welcome them. And so we have, I know, um, Chip Spinnings in the room today. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm messing up. Uh, Chip Spinnings in the room today. Sergeant Ali Ally is in the room today. We have um, Ms. Hewitt, who is the delegate for um, Mr. Grody. And then we have from Ohio State, from um, Dr. Wendy Smooth. Her delegate is Dr. Camille Quinn. Dr. Camille Quinn. College of Social Work. Social Work. So is there anyone else that I... I think everybody else has been in. Oh, hi. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> From Nation White Children. So, so uh, uh, Deshana has been on the phone for our meetings, but she certainly has been present, but not been in the room. And so I thank you for being here. I also want to welcome, you'll be hearing from our presenters in just a few moments. I want to welcome them because I know it takes a lot of effort to be able to put these presentations together, but they're here as subject matter experts. And that is so important. We are in the education phase of our commission, which means we're learning from, um, from the subject matter experts. We're also having our listening sessions where we are, we had two this week. We had one that had about 100 people that were um, attended our listening session on Tuesday um, that about 30 people spoke and it was focused on the agencies that are working with our girls. That evening we also had a listening session with the uh, parents or caregivers or of our girls. We also um, so that, and it were great sessions. We've learned a lot from the caregivers as well as the parents. And next week, we will have our listing session on the 27th from 6 to 8, where we'll be hearing from our girls. And so for the commissioners that are here that have programs that work with our girls of color, our black girls, we want to make sure that those voices are heard. And we, and how those listing sessions are handled is that we've asked these, the two main questions we're asking everyone is, what is the current quality, what is the current quality of life for black girls in our city? And the second question is, what can we do to improve their lives? And we're not saying that all girls in Columbus don't have a good quality of life. Some girls have a very good quality of life. We want to make it better. For those girls whose life isn't as great, we want to make sure that we try to move them to great and greatness. So that's what this commission is really about. Um, I want to um, thank the commissioners that came to those meetings. Thank you for coming out and listening and hopefully you have learned a lot about our girls. I will tell you that after having those two meetings, after reading the, um, some of the presentations that we're going to have today, and having the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals, I tell you, um, there is a need for the Commission on Black Girls. There's absolutely a need. And I think that at the end of the uh, education portion of this, and we start putting out, here's what the current quality of life happens to be, and here are the recommendations. This is about making sure that the community knows what's going on. Many of us who are black women, we certainly do know some of the issues that we face, and whether we have privilege or not have privilege, we still have issues because we are black women. But I will tell you, when you listen to what these presenters have shared, it, you know, today, literally I had to just kind of get myself together to come over here because when you start to hear what our girls are going through it is a it it you know for them to be able to get up and function however they're functioning every day is um is really a miracle 
Because today, when I was in my office, I literally felt like staying over there and not coming over here. But I said, you know what? Get yourself together and get over there because this is all about hope and help moving our young girls forward. And so I'm happy that you're here. I look forward to these presentations and uh, we've got a lot of work to do. But together, we will change our black girls' lives and we change their lives, we change all girls' lives, and we change our community. So thank you, commissioners, for being here, and I look forward to um, healthy dialogue amongst the commissioners as well as um, the presenters that will present today. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Fran Fraser, our co-chair. Good evening. Oh, Good evening. At our first meeting, the commissioners were given a silhouette of a girl. And we asked you to interview a girl and give us an idea about the kind of thing she thinks about. The, who are her go-to people? What does she care about? What does she worry about? What does she stand for? What does she believe in? How does she spend her time and her money? And we heard from several of our commissioners. And we thought we would give some of the other commissioners who didn't get a chance to talk about their interviews with a black girl an opportunity to do that. So I was wondering if there were one or two of you who might want to share that didn't get a chance to share at our last meeting. Or does that mean you didn't do your homework? <laughs> Be great, Chip. Thank you. I can share. Um, I met with two young ladies. Um, the first young lady, uh, as I recall, she was in foster care. She was actually at a group home at the time and had had significant challenges and barriers for a long time. But uh, she had a mentor. It seemed like the mentor for the first time had kind of been there and stuck with her for some period of time. Um, she was very interested in somewhat where she got ex, uh, an exposure to culinary, to cooking, and that is her passion now, and that's what she wants to do, and she's been accepted at Columbus State, and so she sees that as an opportunity going forward. So. How, how old was she? She was 17. Okay, yeah, 17, 18. Maybe she just turned 18, but um, yeah. Uh, actually, we heard at, um, at one of the listening sessions that home ec, uh, I've actually, in fact, it was a teacher who said that that's a missing art. Yeah. She felt it was a missing art for a lot of our girls. She so critiques many of the food that she's had with her, many places that she's been that was, wow. you know, but it's good. Thank you. Anybody else? Linda? I'll share. Um, my girl was 12 years old and it was interesting. She really liked to play. She plays basketball on her school team. And, but her goal is, I said, what do you really think about? And she really wants to be a surgeon. She's like very focused. She um, wants to go to college. She's already outlined it. She told me Kent State, Harvard, or Yale. <laughs> um, and you know, what does she stand for? She said she believed in God. Um, what she's worried about, she said, what the world is going to be when she really grows up and to be a full woman. She's like, I hear all this politics in the news, and so that kind of concerned her. She really said she had two best friends, and similar, she liked to cook. She liked to bake, bake brownies and that kind of thing. So, Thanks, Linda. Anybody else? Michael? Um, I spoke with um, uh, the daughters of a friend of mine that I've known since uh, childhood, um, but unfortunately I haven't gotten to know the girls very well, so this was a great opportunity to speak with them. There are three sisters. I spoke with the two older ones. They're both teenagers, and uh, they rely a lot on one another um, for the confidence that they really have and the support that they have felt. Um, but that is in contrast to what they see and hear a lot, um, both at school um, and 
in the various sources of media that are engaging with them every day. And they talked a lot about how their parents, um, who have a really good, strong, committed relationship, um, have been really impactful for them despite the normal challenges that life brings their way and the unique challenges that they face as black girls. And they were acutely aware of the unique situation that we're in as a community and as a country right now. Um, and I was, I didn't have to ask many questions. They kind of just, they steered me, um, but they, they kept coming back to the sense of community that they have at home um, and how they're concerned about what the community for them will look like when they leave in a few years. So that kind of stabilization of the community is really important. For them, it absolutely was a, a theme mm -hmm. throughout the, the conversation. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? So thank you very much. Um, you will get other homework activities from time to time. I just want you to know that. Thank you. Can I make a nice one? Sure. Again, I want to recognize the commissioner that um, is here that I know we haven't seen because of other work commitments, but Ben Tyson has now joined us, and we're happy that he is here. I also want to recognize from um, council member uh, Page's office, Rolanda Hampton, her legislative uh, aide is in the room, so thank you for being in the room, and thank you. So the next part is, is for me just to, to talk about the subject matter experts. I won't spend too much time because Councilwoman Tyson went, went over that in, in her intro remarks. But again, to underscore, this is a listening and research process, the first part of it. And so really um, making sure we get the best experts over the next several weeks to, to, to share with us their personal skill sets and expertise in this very important area so that we as, as commissioners can, can dig in and do our work um, with the research team. Um, but one thing I do want to... Uh, piggyback on, on Councilwoman Tyson's point. You know, I had no idea what you were going to say, but the fact that you said you struggled um, coming here today. You know, I too went to some of the listening sessions or one of the listening sessions um, earlier in the week, and I, I want to call out Jill, um, who did a masterful job at, at moderating it, so thank you. But this was the one in the middle of the day, and they had about 100 people, as Councilwoman uh, um, Tyson mentioned. It was unbelievable to hear the test, the personal testimonials of those few who talked about their struggle, and then the real professional landscape that the nurses, social workers, council people, people who work in housing, shelters, they talked about what they see day in and day out with our black girls. And while we kind of think we know, it's staggering. And I too literally said to myself, I don't know if I'm going to show up, but obviously I'm here, and obviously Councilwoman's here, and obviously all of you are here, so clearly we are going to show up to do this work. But it is just jaw-droppingly um, shocking as to the condition. So I really, really hope that when we get to that finish line of having some recommendations, um, that we can then implement them and measure change, because we, we have to move the needle. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll punt it back over to our first, present, our first presenter. Um, is it Aaron Upchurch? Mm -hmm. Great. So Aaron Upchurch from MSSA, LI, and she's also a social worker from Kaleidoscope, who will share with us her presentation. Thank you for being here with us. Did you have a you have bio? Oh my good. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, um, Council Member Tyson, to the chairs. Um, very excited to be here. Um, I, as noted, I'm a social worker. I've been practicing for approximately 20 years, um, and I am the executive director for Kaleidoscope Youth Center. Kaleidoscope is a trauma-informed, healing-centered organization that centers the needs of LGBTQ plus young people, um, so it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and then the plus, there's a lot of other letters that go there, um, and allies, so they're friends. Uh, we support them through support, advocacy, uh, community engagement, and education. So my understanding is that you all have a copy of this, and if it's okay, I'd like to actually share more of a story, to, which I think will best answer the questions of the quality of life for black girls and what the community can do to help. 
I grew up in Hilliard, Ohio. My family moved there from North Ohio when I was seven years old. And for the context of size of Hilliard, when I graduated, there was just one high school, and now there are three. My experience growing up was one in which I was consistently the only black girl or person in the class, on a team, or in a group. Sometimes there would be two to three others. However, this was always more of an exception. Growing up black in a mostly white city, you learn fairly early on all the ways that you do not fit in or that you do not belong. Sometimes this communication is subtle, like never seeing pictures of people who look like you in your classrooms, never seeing teachers who have similar skin color. Other times it's more direct and violent, like the times I was called blackie or nigger or when a cross was burned on my family's fence in our backyard when I was nine years old. Added to this experience was a lack of visual representation in TV and film, and limited examples of leadership or positive images of people of color in change-making roles. I don't recall the exact moment I actually realized I was black, as I'm sure this was bloomed in the midst of all my experiences, but something that I vividly remember and recall is the sense of not fitting in, which I later learned was actually my experience of not belonging. Belonging is primal and fundamental to our sense of happiness and well-being. As humans, we need to belong to one another, to our friends and families, and our culture, our country, and even in our world. Research indicates that childhood and adolescent experience of belonging leads to decreased symptoms of anxiety and depression, decreased engagement in self-harm, decreased suicidality, and decreased likelihood of substance abuse and dependency. Protectively, Belonging supports us cognitively, socially, and allows us to develop a sense of personal agency to impact our individual and community experiences. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, belonging is noted as a psychological need and directly on the path of self-actualization and one, something that most of us would describe as thriving. In my own quest for belonging, elementary school me searched for ways to be closer to what everyone else was around me. I knew I couldn't change my skin, but I could change my hair, so I had a relaxer um, where I made it straight. Um, I was already well-spoken and articulate, so the other, only thing left to look at was my facial features. So in my 10-year-old wisdom, I first tried to narrow my nose with a clothespin. Outside of that discomfort, there was no other change yielded from this method. So my next step, of course, was my lips. Convinced that they were too big, and because they weren't the size of my friends, I developed a plan to make them smaller. And I decided that I would keep my mouth closed and hold them in, which looked a little bit like this. And so in my efforts to belong, I chose to shrink myself and effectually gave up my voice in exchange. Now, anyone who knows me would be surprised or even disagree that I never had a voice. I was fortunate to have parents that supported and modeled speaking up, but until a few years ago, I was never speaking in a way that was actually connected to my own belonging. I filtered, I shrank, and I otherwise silenced my actual voice, and at times, I chose not to speak at all. I never felt the full agency of my being, and as a result, was only able to partially show up, and even then, I struggled with my actual sense of self and belonging. When I first learned of this commission, I was excited to know that the lives of black girls, girls like my daughter and my nieces, were being centered in this way. I eagerly looked at the pictures posted on social media and I noted all the familiar faces. And then unfortunately my excitement began to diminish as I realized I wasn't seeing any out black women or persons from my community. I use the word out intentionally as it relates to visibility and makes a statement about obvious inclusion. Instead of making assumptions, I messaged Councilmember Tyson and her team, sharing my excitement, and then noted that I did not recognize any people of color from the LGBTQ community, specifically any out, black, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender women. And then I directly asked two questions. One, was there any LGBTQ representation on the commission? And two, were there any black, out, black, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender women on the commission? In response, I was informed that the commissioners were not asked about their sexual orientation. And so as a city that has branded on its diversity and inclusion, and one that prides itself on partnership and support of the LGBTQ community, I found it concerning that there was no intention of ensuring culturally relevant LGBTQ representation on this important and necessary commission. Black girls are gay, we are lesbians, we are bisexual, we are transgender, and we are non-binary. 
and many unfortunately continue to have experiences similar to my own of not belonging, which is often communicated the same way as it was for me 30 years ago. Refusing to honor these identities through visibility, representation, roles, and leadership is an exclusionary practice that further separates us from our survival and our thriving. Wonderfully, a plan for the commission, as was described earlier, is to collect stories from our communities as a way to inform its next steps. So today, I wanna to ask you to consider the impact of asking young people to share their stories and engage in work where leadership is not reflective of their community, even though there is an opportunity to do so, and especially when their voices do not appear to be valued at a higher level. It's not okay to desire us for our stories, experiences, and wisdom and not effectively invite us to the decision-making table. To be asked to engage in labor and freely given of our time only to be denied access is a form of exploitation. Effective leadership is representative and failing to include culturally relevant representation from the LGBTQ community on a commission for black girls appears exclusionary and is a disservice for the girls for whom this work will ultimately serve. In closing, we know that young people harm or kill themselves because they don't think they belong in this world and believe that their lives don't matter. Many black girls and young women hate the way they look. They hate their bodies because they never or rarely see themselves reflected as good or good enough. My own daughter, now in middle school, has struggled this way since elementary school. And one of my sisters is relatedly in recovery for an eating disorder. We here in this room and at these tables of leadership have a responsibility to, at minimum, decrease the harm that's being done by lack of representation and practices of exclusion with the ultimate goal, of course, being that it no longer exists on our watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Please don't sit down yet, um, because we have a, a Q&A period after each oh, presenter, okay. so for about five minutes. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, last. Uh, Last meeting, the, the um, subject matter experts were talking about physical, spiritual health, and teen pregnancy. Today's subject matters are talking about um, behavioral and mental health. So I just wanted to put that as mm -hmm. a theme for today. Um, so are there any questions for, for our, our speaker? Is it this? So, I'll, I mean, I'll, so while we wait for questions, I, I do have a... Uh, I'll lead with a question for you. So appreciate your presentation. Um, you were very assertive with the idea that, and I wrote down some notes here, that the leadership, meaning this commission, um, doesn't reflect certain groups, in this case you're talking mm -hmm. about LGBT, and then you specifically use words like the leadership has denied them access. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how did you arrive at that conclusion mm -hmm. that we, because when you talked about initially, you talked about collaboration, collective. And so how are you so convinced that this august and diverse group isn't going to be inclusive in conversations uh, on, not, on, 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 on these matters? Sure. And, 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 so, and so, for example, we also don't have any blind people here. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have a blind person. We also don't have any deaf people on the panel. We also don't have every Caribbean island represented here. We don't have any, every South American country. So at what point for you would this commission actually be appropriately staffed? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, in terms of feeling assertive about it or being assertive, I was raised to speak that way. So that's- no, I think that's great. I that's gonna that. always come across that way. Um, I asked mm -hmm. and I did not get the answer that it was different. So if it's different, this would be a great opportunity to share that there is that representation and then that might answer that question. Um, in terms of your question about um, all the other missing pieces, I guess you could Black say. Black girls are in every one of those pieces. And what I'm gonna say to you and to anybody else who is advocating on behalf of their community, I think that we run the risk of mockery or being flippant to ask such a question um, because we know that we cannot go and pick, handpick every single person from every single community represented in this city. I know that, I've been around a long time, I know a lot of people do. I am here to represent the youth that I work for and worth at Kaleidoscope Youth Center. Mm -hmm. And those youth are LGBTQ+. Mm -hmm. 
they are ages 12 to 20, and then sometimes 18 to 24, and 25% of them are youth of color, mostly black. So that's who I'm here to speak on behalf of. However, you brought up a wonderful point. Where is the inclusion from the other communities? Why are there not members who are deaf or blind or maybe not English speaking? I think that's a question for you all to ask and answer and not me. Sure, and, and, to, and to be clear, the question was more rhetorical one because every time you do investigations and these kind of things, you can't possibly have absolutely every single, I mean, there are seven billion people on the planet mm -hmm. and essentially we're all different. You're not going to have everyone, and, and I think Councilwoman Tyson did a fantastic job at trying to ensure diversity and inclusion here. So I really do appreciate, though, your presentation and your perspective, and I'm glad you called with the questions, and we absolutely hear you loud and clear. And to be clear, I, I um, didn't ask for inclusion from every community. It was the LGBTQ plus community specifically people of color, mm -hmm. black people. And so, sure. again, I think that opens a really great discussion, mm -hmm. though, on in, in the city of Columbus that is so rich in its diversity. Mm -hmm. How do we actually find that representative leadership mm -hmm. in all places? That's mm -hmm. a wonderful question. I don't think we clearly don't have the answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to add, when we have questions about diversity, to pawn it off on we cannot possibly include everyone is really... Um, with all due respect, a little lazy, mm -hmm. because we can always do better. Mm -hmm. I can do better in my organization in terms of who I hire, mm -hmm. the youth that we do in terms of outreach and everything else I do. And mm -hmm. so I guess my invitation is to, yes, acknowledge there's a lot of diversity and mm -hmm. always asking how can we do better, how can we be better represented, and how can we actually be good leaders here in this city? Absolutely, and I will end with that's exactly why we invited you here. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Stacy Swenson. You were in the back. We couldn't find you. I was like, where is she? Stacy, thank you for um, being with us. Um, Stacy's with uh, Primary One Health, and will introduce more of herself. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, great, got it. Okay. Um, I want to first thank Erin for her courage um, and for her voice, putting that into the room. And um, it, it, is everyone here at the table on the commission on black girls? No. How many are on the commission? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, and I would have to agree with Erin that represent <laughs> that representation just from a statistical point of view would kind of naturally be included so I just want to start off by challenging myself since I was already feeling nervous I thought I would just dump some more of that on myself so well we're here to talk about behavioral health so um, and this is what happens when you invite social workers <laughs> into your room <laughs> So my name is Stacy Swenson. I am the Director of Behavioral Health and Social Work at Primary One Health, formerly Columbus Neighborhood Health Centers. Um, and can you, are you able to hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Um, I have been with community, uh, with Columbus Neighborhood Health Centers, Premier One Health, um, for the past three and a half years. Prior to that, I worked with the College of Social Work at The Ohio State University and um, began a programming um, to start behavioral health at the different health centers um, through a training program with graduate level social workers. So that's kind of how behavioral health started um, where I'm at now. So five years later, we now have behavioral health um, in all of our healthcare centers um, working on doing a trauma-informed approach with the work that we do. Um, my One of my wonderful colleagues, Jeffrey Marable, um, obstetrician um, and the director over women's health, was here, I think, a few meetings ago and so talked about the work that we do a little bit. So I won't um, take up your time going through all of that. Let's see, so we are an FQHC, um, Federally Qualified Health Centers. Um, we operate on a lot of federal health grants and um, just actually this week, I'm gonna brag a little bit because I'm very excited we received a SAMHSA um, grant to work on um, MAT uh, programming through our organization. So I'm pretty excited and still a little overwhelmed about that. 
So, and these are the services that we offer at not all of our health centers. Um, vision and dental, we have two. Um, we some we have some specialty services at some of our healthcare locations. Um, we offer primary care at all of our healthcare locations, and now we have um, women's health and behavioral health at all of our healthcare locations as well. So I'm going to talk about what we do in behavioral health. So we are a, we have an embedded model of behavioral health. If you think of kind of that one-stop shop where someone can come in for pediatrics um, and then also be screened. We screen all of our um, patients who are 12 years of age and older um, by doing a two-question depression screening, um, which is um, we have pretty high rates of um, false negative negatives um, because sometimes what I call hopelessness and someone else calls hopelessness might not be the same thing. And so um, patients also sometimes don't want to talk about or deal with depression or any other mental health issue. So um, it's pretty common for them just to circle the right answer. Um, and so we do get quite a few false negatives. But the way that we identify um, black girls who we see at our organization is either through this depression screening when they come in to see a pediatrician or a family practitioner, or um, a medical provider is concerned. Maybe a parent bringing them in has said something to them that's concerning, or they've just had a positive pregnancy test, um, and so behavioral health will be brought in in those situations just to kind of check on things and see what services might be needed, or if the patient or family member requests um, or says that they are interested in behavioral health services. One of the things that we do in our setting is we are very careful not to identify ourselves as social workers. One of the things I did not realize when I started working in primary care, I had come from community mental health, where we were all very proud social workers. And so what I noticed, though, is that the medical providers would come and say, nobody wants to talk to you. And I, I couldn't believe that. I had this delightful team of amazing students. And I'm like, who wouldn't want to talk? talk to these students. Um, but it took me a little while to figure it out, just me being ignorant that way, that um, that social worker in some settings is a little more alarming. And so now when I train new staff, regardless of their position there, I ask them to kind of conceptualize themselves as a young woman, perhaps African American, perhaps Latino, um, and ask them to imagine that, um, that you have two young children at home and a boyfriend you're not crazy about, but you know he helps pay the bills a little bit. Um, and that maybe you smoke a little marijuana here and there to just kind of deal with it. And you come in because you've had that horrible stom stomach virus that everyone else has had and you've just felt terrible, not able to eat. So you come in and what's the first thing that happens if you're age 12 to maybe f as old as 50 um, and you're female? What's the first thing that happens if your eye is itchy or your throat is scratchy or you're nauseous? What's the first thing that happens? You get a pregnancy test. Um, regardless of sexual orientation and, you know, we just pee in a cup. Um, and so um, you do that and the provider comes in and says, well, the reason why you've been so sick is because you're pregnant. Congratulations. Um, and you burst into tears and you're not quite sure what to do and your mind is going 90 miles an hour and it's, you just can't believe this is happening. And she leans over and she pats you on your knee and very well-meaning says, hey, sweetie, I'm going to go get the social worker to talk to you. Um, and so what do you think she thinks about that? What, what comes to her mind that either... So Children's Services is going to come take her kids, or she's some, somehow going to get in trouble. And if she's um, an undocumented uh, immigrant, then she is probably afraid that INS is going to be called. So that can be very scary. So we, that's why over and over you'll hear me say behavioral health, um, because that language is just a little bit friendlier to the patients that we see in the health centers. Um, for one, it has the word health in it, and so that feels a little less scary. And then it also, nobody really knows what behavioral health is. <laughs> so um, they may not know what it is, but it's just a lot less frightening. So those are the ways that behavioral health may be called directly into the exam room. We like to see patients when they're there. We don't want them scheduled out in three weeks. We don't want them to slip through the cracks, although it does happen because there just aren't enough resources, there aren't enough of us in the centers. But as much as possible, we love it when our providers will come get us and bring us to room six where someone is crying. And so we really, especially with kids, 
if they are in need. That crisis is right now. That crisis isn't, you know, three weeks or six months, depending on where, where somebody might be referred. It's right now. It's today. And so we try and get into the exam room and talk to them in the exam room, which is also less threatening. Um, so we try and do, ideally, that same day connection when we can. OK. Um, so we have been providing these services since 1997 um, in terms of healthcare services, but our organization has changed significantly over the past five years. Um, we do have enabling services, and we're getting better at providing those enabling services. So that's been pretty exciting to see how we are overcoming some of those barriers like transportation. Um, Interpret, having interpreting services there, doing case management, linkage to social um, resources. So here are some outcomes. These are similar to the outcomes that you saw or some data. Um, our UDS, our universal um, data set that, that we have to collect for HRSA, um, this is the numbers that we pull. So one of the things that that you will see, oh, sorry, that's very small, um, is that we actually don't see that many black girls in our centers um, because our locations are very, some of them are very close to Nationwide Children's Hospital. That's where a lot of folks go for their, their behavioral health and for their medical um, care. But we did see um, 15, 161 black girls ages 11 to 22 over the past year, um, and about 11% of those girls did see behavioral health, um, which is a, is typical for us. About we see about 10 to 12 percent of any a population that we're serving, and so that's right in line. But I also believe that that number um, could be higher and possibly needs to be higher. Okay. Um, so what we know and, and what you all have been learning and know either from your own experience or, or from what um, you've been exposed to is that much of mental health issues and substance use disorders come from trauma. Um, if not the cause, then definitely um, a complication in someone coming into this world with a, a you know a um, predisposition maybe to have some anxiety or to have some depression. And that trauma can flip the switch on a lot of that and, and really turn up the volume. And so that is absolutely what we see. The girls that we see in our health center, almost all of them have co complex trauma. Um, whether that's just that they're living in poverty or whether they've been grown up in a, in a violent situation or whether they have teen pregnancy um, and the trauma that can come with that, um, drinking, homelessness. Um, and what the other thing that we know about adverse childhood experiences is that the more that they have, the more health conditions they're going to have have and the more risk that's going to be involved as they grow up and become adults. Um, and so really, we want as much as possible to get to those kiddos when they're in our health center um, so that we can start to put some things in place as soon as possible. Um, other concerns that we see are just mental health issues that may look like behavioral concerns, that may look like someone acting out. Um, teenagers particularly uh, tend to exhibit anxiety and depression symptoms that look like acting out. Um, there can be this irritability. They don't tend to experience depression the way adults do. They don't lay on the couch and just feel, ugh. They kind and it can come in more waves, which is not bipolar. Um, I don't mean to, to feed into that because sometimes there's a stereotype that if there's any type of mood swing that that's going to look like that's going to be bipolar and that's not what I'm talking about. But that they just, they have more energy in general and so that you're going to see that in any kind of um, mood disorder that might be there. We also do you know, talk with our girls about their exposure to racism, what that's like for them, what their perspective is. And so we, we do see that quite a bit, and they will talk about that with us when they are asked. Um, there can be a lot of parenting stressors for young um, single mothers. Um, and the other thing that we see that comes out of that is the sibling set that may be growing up in a family where, you know, mom needs some help. 
um, she's working three jobs or she has her own mental health issues that are not being addressed or substance use concerns. And so oftentimes the oldest child in the home is kind of parentified and, and is help raising the siblings. And so that can really create a tremendous amount of stress. What we say to those young women is you're very resilient and you just keep going and you're really strong, but really she may not be getting her needs met. And that can be experienced in the brain as, as a type of trauma or adverse experience. Am I going over? I lose track of time. Okay. <laughs> And then so some of the other um, concerns that we see and we'll love for you to look at is, um, you know, those very complex issues of colorism and internalized racism. <laughs> no, all right, okay. <laughs> Um, self-esteem issues, body image, fear of fat, other types of um, self-esteem issues that come into play. We see quite a bit in our centers of undereducated or uneducated young women who maybe just weren't taught that they can um, do more with education. Um, Underemployment, unemployment, of course, knowledge of resources, access to resources, living environments, um, not living in safe neighborhoods where they don't feel safe when they're in their home, um, those kinds of things. And then for us, the challenges are really staffing ratios. Um, we have staffed up with behavioral health because we were having so many high-risk patients that we were seeing a lot of, I, I was surprised when I started working in primary care, how many patients we saw that struggle with suicidality. Um, and so we really staffed up you know, for that advanced level of doing those types of risk assessments regularly. Um, but what we haven't had access to enough of is um, kind of community health workers that could go into the communities and really work with families there. Um, just awareness of what's available and, and resource in the community, in the populations in general. And then of course funding. I know everybody complains about funding, right? So I shouldn't, I shouldn't um, be bragging about my big fancy SAMHSA grant that we got. Um, <laughs> it's for adults. Um, and then high rates of uninsured, unemployment, poverty, um, and just some of the health conditions that can come for people who have um, been forced to neglect their health care over long periods of time. And our suggestion for improving quality of life is integrated behavioral health services right again in primary care regardless of where that primary care is um, but also in all educational settings i really believe that behavioral health has to be where the people are and where they feel comfortable that's the only way we're going to lessen the stigma um, there just aren't many people who pick up the phone and when they're struggling and say i'm going to call a counseling center Besides, they'll probably be put on a wait list for three to six months, um, especially if they need psychiatry. But we really need to have more mental health care where our girls are um, so that there isn't that stigma. So it's just someone down the hall um, who they can talk to when they need to versus scheduling an appointment that they're probably not going to be able to get to anyway. Um, and so that the person is there when they need it. Um, having immediate access to mental health care is the only way that we're going to overcome some of this. Um, and so whether that's in a school, college setting, whether that's in you know having someone who is available for those students who are doing online learning, those kinds of things. Um, and then having specialized um, prenatal groups for girls who are going through pregnancy together to reduce that stigma and to increase their self-esteem around it. I did want to share with you that I was a teen mother. Um, I did get pregnant in high school, and I have this amazing 31-year-old daughter who works in urban education and this beautiful 15-month-old grandson. Um, and the only reason that I went to college is because people told me that I could. Um, and I never assumed that I wouldn't. It was hard, um, but I did it. And I, and I don't want you to think that I came from a middle class family that supported me through that because I did not. I grew up in rural Appalachia um, and did that on my own. Again, I can't really go back and define how that happened. I just know that it did happen. But I also know that as long as we're telling our girls that if you know their life is ruined or their life is over when they get pregnant, then that's what we create for them. And I think we need for, for all of us to be champions that when adversity occurs to them, whether it's pregnancy, that it can become something amazing for them, um, that they can still continue to, to do the life that they thought they would. It'll look a little different because my life was definitely changed and it was definitely changed for the better. And, better, and I believe that I, 
through her, we have changed the world for the better. So um, I thank you for all the work that you are doing here. And um, keep up the good work, continue learning and challenging yourself. So. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Um, I have two questions for you pertaining to the solutions you've suggested, and, and they're, they're certainly good ones. And we've heard, I think, from one of your colleagues, actually, about the community <laughs> health worker piece. Um, I suppose that's an issue for, for primary one that they're excited to talk about. Um, can you speak to the in-school um, uh, services that you're, that you're discussing? Are you aware of any communities around the country um, I know that Cincinnati has a couple of schools with some programming, and Cleveland has at least one. Mm -hmm. um, but are there any communities that are doing it really well integrated into an entire school system? And the second question is, what do we do in the summer um, in those communities when we don't have that direct access to provide the services where the girls are? So, um, yes, there is um, a system in Cincinnati and one in Cleveland. Um, I don't know enough about the work that they do to say that they are doing it successfully. I think they're both still pro relatively in their infancy stages. I do know one of them, and I apologize. I'm not sure which one it is. They stay open during the summer. So it is a health center as well as a school. Um, and so they do stay open, you know can unlock the door, you can you know, continue to have the janitor come in and empty the trash. And so they continue to serve families. Um, again, I, I don't have the details of that, but I thought that was a fabulous idea when I heard about that. Um, I do know that that is something, we have that on our list, <laughs> we're not there yet, but it's, it's the only thing that makes sense to me to overcoming some of this. Did I answer both of those questions? Uh, just two questions. One, is there any focus within your, the primary care setting with regard to historical trauma and its link to current day trauma, particularly with African American girls and the connection to um, populations that have been impacted by slavery? And the second question is, among your screening instruments for trauma, do any of them ask about police contact? So um, the first one, I absolutely believe in the epigenetics of trauma and that it sticks to DNA and that generational trauma just makes that stronger. I also, again, this is, you're not probably gonna see any research on this, so this is just Stacy's theory, but I think until we start to look at that more, we're not gonna be able to deal with um, infant mortality. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, I think that there's impact there. Um, it, and because I know, like, just in terms of when we talk about um, what's happening, you know, uh, police violence, that kind of thing. When I now see a white police officer, I start to get scared, not for myself, but because I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm already having cortisol being released. I'm not at risk. There may not even be, a, you know, a black kid that's walking down the street, but I'm afraid that at some point there might be and that that could be dangerous for them. So that in terms of when we think about just our world is just more stressful um, and that, that that piece about trauma and how our brains are just not regulating anymore. And so, I, I mean, I think that's part of the issue with police officers. They are taught to be hypervigilant and to be scared of young, strong black men. And so they are so hypervigilant that, you know, they're very reactionary. Um, and so we're just not regulated as as a society very much anymore and I do see I mean I, I feel like I've seen the effects of mental health change over the past 10 or 15 years um, and it could be just that I've you know I've been doing this longer and so I'm seeing things in a more subtle way but and maybe Dwayne can speak to that a little bit too if he if he has seen that as well um, but yeah absolutely both of those things yeah so it, it's really interesting to me because there are definitely some girls that you know are just kind of like what are you talking about and some that will give you kind of the essay that they wrote about it and so I think that there is awareness but some will absolutely say no that's not an issue for them and so again that's not something we track so I don't have data on that but just anecdotal um sergeant ally oh Mr. oh miss Hewitt yeah okay um hi thank hi. you for the work you do no period. absolutely thank um you. so in numbers as in Columbus the disparity is like three to one, black women, 
Yep. Uh, infant mortality rates. Yep. Right. Latino is increasing yep. black significantly. Mm -hmm or black, Latino is decreasing black women, mm -hmm. increasing mm -hmm. significantly. Um, Which so I tells have two me questions. that the work we're doing right. is Necessary. working, but there's still a component we're not Absolutely. Yeah. Totally value yep. what you do. Um, looking at the numbers, I do have two questions. Um, is there work in for first and fourth trimester? Um, and also I would say, are there partnerships with local nonprofit communities that are specifically geared towards uh, black sexual health, family-oriented health, in-home health, um, is there work being done there to really aggregate better numbers in terms of who you're reaching? And again, there are probably programs I'm not aware of, but again, we're talking about like a sprinkling here and there. So is there enough to move the needle? Absolutely not. Um, in terms of, you know, first and fourth trimester um, engagement, as we look at, you know, perinatal mood disorders and those being exacerbated among young black women, um, you know, again, we do what we can with what we have, but no, there's really not enough to go around in terms of making sure that even with our patients, and again, our team is really passionate about it, but there's just not enough. Um, and so we will, if the provider comes to get us or they screen positive, then we'll go in and start to do an intervention. And we, we want to check on women um, as soon as possible when they come in. And we do education with them in their third trimester about what could potentially happen without trying to scare them. You know, but, but just letting them know what their brain and body might go through and that they're at risk for that, if, especially if they have a history of a type of mood disorder. Um, but no, there's definitely not enough. What's that? So you're open to that conversation, though. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I got work oh, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, so again, thank you for your presentation. I just want to clarify um, that nowhere in Columbus Police's um, training academy are we taught to fear young black males. Um, Hypervigilance is real, and uh, that is something that you know we'll we'll deal with our entire lives, even after we are retired. But um, we are definitely not taught to fear young black males. I appreciate that. And, and again, I'm speaking in generalities because some of, and again, nothing about what's happening here, just in terms of generalities and what I've heard. I, I think how that training would be happens. A, a, not a good generality to make, though. Okay, I mean, appreciate just, that. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Yep, appreciate it. Uh, I just had a question regarding the, um, the lack of community, really, outreach workers, mm -hmm. and the idea that uh, my question is really around that generally I think the community prefers to have mental health services really in the community as much as possible and not so much sort of in the office, the old traditional mm -hmm. aspects. And with behavioral health redesign as of June, July, uh, there's more behavioral health access in the community. So mm -hmm. the question is really, is there some opportunities through Medicaid to increase the ratios and at the same time take into consideration the, the diversity of the folks that would be doing the work so that um, black girls can relate more closely to people they look like in the community. Have you? Yeah, absolutely, which is so very much needed. Um, and Dwayne, I'm hoping, I'm sorry, I don't mean to like pass the bug, but I'm hoping because I know he has teams that go in out into the community. Teams that, so social workers or community health outreach workers who go into the community are usually lower level staff, less education, um, which doesn't mean that they're not qualified. The training needs to be there. But what we see is that those are the most stressful jobs when they're out in the community. And they are the, the um, paid the poorest. So what we see is the, the social workers that get the most training um, are paid the best and get to be in the office. And we really need systemically to kind of, whoops, to switch those. Um, but the problem, I mean, it's, it's way, way bigger than probably we can take on here. Um, but just in terms of the way that education works, how things are recruited, how people are paid, it's just, it's, it's big, yeah. 
I, I just re really want to just share this comment. I know that Primary One is here. Be last in September, they were here to talk about you know the physical health and talk. And so, Primary One is basically an organization that really is really focused on your the physical health of people in their community. They are not saying they're the experts in behavioral health. What they are so the questions I think as we talk to Dwayne and 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 others who are really focused more on the behavioral health will be able to have a very different presentation. I think the key was that uh, at primary at primary one, you're able to um, see your patients who have a need, who have physical health needs, and you're then looking at those and seeing that who have behavioral health needs. Some of them you may be able to. Um, work with and be able to help them and others you're able to work within the community to to um, recommend they get services at other places so I, I really really want to thank you for coming and at least and sharing that you understand the importance of meeting someone where they are at that moment and then deciding where do we go next with that individual so thank you thank you Ms. Our next subject expert, Dwayne Cesaris. Um. From Directions for Youth and Families. Here we go. I got you. All right. Thanks for putting me out on that. It's a, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Actually, I'm following a line of social workers, so this is great. There are so many social workers here. We're representing, we're in the house. So uh, actually said in the house at a board meeting this morning, and they said, what century are you in? You need to, uh... all right, uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about our agency. Um, we started actually uh, through, were several mergers, and um, the Florence Crittenden home started in Columbus, Ohio in 1899. So it was a home for unwed mothers. So that is a part of our history. Uh, we uh, um, uh, proudly have started to embrace the name back into the fold. We're doing an awful lot of work and I'll get to that in a minute because it's specifically um, geared toward women of color and, and particularly black girls and uh, the research that we participated in nationally with ACES. Um, our continuum of services, we uh, are probably the only um, social service agency in Columbus that expands everything from psychiatric and psychological services all the way to after school and summer programs. So, and everything else that's in between. Um, our methodology is outreach, so, and this isn't anything new for us. Uh, the populations we serve, they are not going to go to a traditional mental health service to go get counseling. That's just not going to happen. And uh, um, Stacy, uh, Stacy and I used to work together years ago. Things have changed because I will tell you, um, we have over 70 licensed therapists that are out in the community. 90% of them are at the master's level. Um, we truly do believe internally that uh, you do not have to be a manager to make management pay. Um, if, if these are the people who are going to be the best service and they're the ones with the longest uh, uh, um, experience, why do they have to go into managers just to make more money? Um, if you truly believe your clients are number one, then you need to make sure you have your best people with them. So that has kind of shifted. It's challenged us, um, but it is something that we really did move, had need to move uh, uh, the lever on because uh, um, she was right. Before, it was all new workers, and with the challenges that are out there in the community, um, we, we really needed to equip our people with, with the skills they needed. We are part of the uh, National Crittenden. Um, uh, uh, there's a couple people, Fran is a part of that family, uh, ad hoc in a sense, um, we're, we're very happy about that. Uh, National Crittenden's focus is on girls' issues, so there's only 26 of us in the country, we're only uh, affiliated by uh, name, there, there's no dues and we're not one big body, but we get together regularly. Um, actually last year we uh, had a conference in solidarity in Washington DC, all 50 states uh, were present there, Fran was there as well, it was primarily on black girls and black girls issues because we wanted to bring to the attention of the country um, how this is becoming an outlier that requires specific uh, programming to address some of the issues. 
Uh, Trauma-informed practice, you've heard about that a lot. We work, started working with the Institute um, out of Boston um, over five years ago in Case Western Reserve and their resiliency folks um, for three years. Uh, we have uh, continued on that path. Um, Dr. Roy Wade out of Children's Hospital in Philadelphia uh, wanted to make sure that the ACE tool, which for those that don't know is the a trauma assessment tool, uh, was sensitive to uh, the needs and, and the experiences of inner city, um, particularly inner city people of color. We were part of two national studies uh, with him in doing that. Um, and, and so one of the biggest things that came out of the initial study was that if you have an A score of six or higher, your life expectancy goes down uh, 20 years. So we know this now. Uh, scores of seven or higher, 80% of them are women, and 90% of them are women of color. That is an outlier. So when you have outliers, you have to start to look at gender responsive uh, uh, programming that's gonna specifically address that, and it should not just be folded in to tr traditional programming. So I applaud you, uh, uh, Council Member Tyson, for putting together this uh, uh, um, uh, committee to start to look at these, and all of you who are committing yourselves and your time um, to really take a look at this issue and put it to the forefront. It is really what we are trying to do in National Critton as a body, um, and, and I'm happy to be in a city um, that has decided to finally formulate something that is going to address those things. So thank you all. Uh, this is our, our continuum of services. I'm not going to go through all of them. Wow, I can't even read those. So, you know, you can read them. Um, I don't even know what they are. <laughs> they just throw me in front of places. It's our workers who do it. Um, these are our numbers. So these are the specific numbers that we have by age group uh, of um, uh, black girls. This is uh, we were gonna. I was gonna have both numbers up here because not just black girls, but people who are are, are, are women of color. Um, but I said let's just channel it down just to see where our numbers are. Overall, we serve um, almost 6,000 kids and their families in uh, Central Ohio. As I said, all of our programs are outreach. So uh, we are in the homes, we're in the school, in their community. Uh, you truly get to see the toxic stress environments that some of our people live in. Um, you get to see the challenges. So you know it's. You know, when you had old counseling things, and I, I'm glad I'm not in this commission because, you know, you're giving out the homework. Come on. Um, the, uh, but, but in traditional counseling sessions, you know, if they come into the office, you give them homework, they come back the next week, you want to know why they didn't do it. And then you think, well, they're not committed or they're lazy or they really don't care. Go in their home and see what they deal with on a daily basis. And when you do that, doing your homework that you're assigning them doesn't happen to be at the top of the list. They have basic needs that need to be met first and other challenges, and, and these are struggles. And they are real struggles, and we have to be more respectful. You know, it's no wonder at times people are afraid to go in and get help. Uh, number one, health uh, 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 can be a bad word in, in, in some cultures. Um, I can pass, but I'm 100% Mexican, uh, uh, son of Jose Casadas and Amado Lozano. Um, uh, so I will tell you, in, in the uh, Latino community, there is uh, uh, going to get help is weak. Um, it's just not some, it's something that, uh, actually we had a video, one of our young men, who happens to be a young man of color, talked about how he was uh, suicidal. And he knew he needed to get help. Um, he ended up getting hooked up with us. Uh, his father told him, you're an embarrassment to the family. Um, and at that point was the lowest point in his life. He, he, he recognizes now he's, he's Austin Miles is just a really great kid. He can't believe that out of the lowest point in his life, it was the turning point to the best point in his life because he did get help through our organization. He is thriving, um, and, and we just have to recognize those things. Um, outputs and outcomes, we were asked to put that together. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you have them in your sheet. We, we uh, track many, many things. One of the things we also do track is recidivism rates through the court. Um, we track them for one year after services. We want to make sure that what we do has a lasting impact. Um, it's important, particularly when you look at uh, people of color and, and, and girls of color um, are, have a, a really huge overrepresentation uh, um, in the court system and being locked up or being put into placement. And these types of things. It's funny when Pat and I were talking beforehand, she's going, yeah, working with uh, uh, the DD population, they look at her like, you're black, there's black DD? And I said, no, because they lock them up. I mean, that's what they do. So uh, when you start to look at some of these things, these are true challenges that end up happening um, just because of perceptions and how people respond. Um, and we need to educate people to make sure that they understand these things. 
Um, accessibility is a challenge in providing services. Like I said, we uh, uh, end up going to them. Um, so we've kind of eliminated that barrier. We've been outreach for over 35 years, actually. Uh, the stigma of receiving services, I always tell people, going to get services is a person of courage. We need to start recognizing that that is a person of courage that chooses to take over and step up in their life and do something to change it. Change is hard. It is extremely hard. Every person in this room, if you think about one of the biggest changes you had, had to make, it isn't something that somebody told you. It's when you fell flat on your face and got really hurt and made sure you were never going to experience that again. And those are hard things to confront and deal with to move yourself forward. So people who do that are people of courage. Uh, uh, societal responses, um, policy and practice, they, you know, particularly when it comes to black girls. We are, uh, as a national critten body, we're putting this whole thing for uh, looking at uh, juvenile justice so that uh, uh, Child Focus, who advocates for us in Washington, D.C., can get uh, some of these things put into some of the bills. But when you really do start to look at it, there are things that we criminalize black girls for that aren't things that they should be criminalized for. We react to it differently just because they speak out. That's not a critical thinker. That's somebody with an attitude. That vision has to change. It is not a truth. You know, people say some things, and I always tell them, just because you say that out loud doesn't make it a truth. That may be your truth. Well, we know this. Just because you're speaking out, it can mean you are a critical thinker. It doesn't mean you just have a bad attitude. And I believe that's the truth that we do have to embrace. Um, and there are overwhelmingly disproportionate rates uh, of black girls who are suspended, um, who are expelled, um, who are arrested. Uh, and, and we have to address those numbers. Those numbers do not lie. Um, opportunities and provision of services, we have to really look at a full range of somatic services and non-traditional practices. Uh, Rice Sister Rice has a, 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 a great program that um, incorporates a lot of these somatic services when we start look at healing. Um, I think uh, trauma-informed is critical. We have to look at these things. These are things that impact a person's perception. It inter impacts uh, their interaction with their external environment. Um, culturally competent, you know, I used to teach race relations and culture diversity at Ohio State at the master's level. And the first day of class, I used to ask everybody on a, on a scale of one to 10, um, where would you rank yourself in terms of being co culturally competent? Um, the very first time I did this, the first two people who um, both happened to be Caucasian and from the East Coast gave themselves tens. Um, and, and, and yeah, they did. Uh, and, and, and they proceeded to say, we go to the same mall as those people. And I thought, oh, oh, oh. I didn't, as a professor, I didn't want to shut it down because you don't want to shut down. But after the second person said it, I'm looking out and thinking, okay, there's people of color in this room. Somebody needs to step up and say something. And fortunately, somebody did. And I told her after, you know what? You don't even have to come back to class. I'm giving you an A. Um, <laughs> She rescued me. Um, we have to have gender responsive services. We have to understand that there is a huge, huge difference between surveillance and support. And, and we need to recognize that not only as a system, um, but in, in our practices, in our policies, in our procedures, in everything that we do. Um, we, we, it just needs to be a, a, a huge uh, shakeup and analysis of these types of things. So what can this commission do? Well, you're doing it now. It's dialogue. Um, dialogue's first. We got, have to talk about these things. We have to put them on the table. We have to not be afraid uh, um, or, or, or hesitant um, to throw these things out there. They must be addressed. Convening groups to address these things is critical. Um, I always tell people we don't have to do everything. Um, certainly our agency doesn't. We partner with many, many different people. Uh, uh, this is why we're part with, you know, with the, the Center for Healthy Families. I want to address the one thing about the, uh, um, the sexual health and everything. We, um, uh, the 43232 area code, we have a, a, a small center out there. We're hoping to make that bigger. Um, it had 58 uh, deaths last year, infant deaths. Um, it is the third poorest area in the community now. There are little to no services out there, so it tied with Linden with the highest number of deaths. So we have in our center, that's one of our after school and summer programs, we are partnering with Ohio Health to bring in their uh, semi. Um, actually, they just came out today because they have to put in this electrical system that costs $7,000. Are you kidding me? Um, 
uh, I'm just thinking run a cord from the house across the street. Ain't that what you do? But, uh, um, but that is, we're going to start to do that uh, uh, when we are working with uh, Shannon Ginther on this. We are going to wait until our, our new programming started, but we're not going to wait on this. So we are um, bringing that out there in November. I think we'll be ready to go um, so that the women in that community can start to receive services. We also partner with Moms-to-Be, and it's part of the collaboration through the Center for Healthy Families. So, uh, um, you certainly have to collaborate. Education, we have to educate the public on these issues. We have to make it a natural part of the dialogue that we have. Um, advocacy, it's huge. Um, advocacy is, is, it's a social worker thing, so um, uh, it comes natural for us who are in the profession. It should come natural for all of us who work in this field um, and just supporting the services that we have. Um, because we do have to end up having financial support that we can end up reaching the people who are most in need. Uh, this is one of the things I wanted to bring up. In, in September, the Violence Against Women Act is going to expire, and it needs to be reauthorized. I encourage all of you uh, to call your legislators and support this. We cannot, cannot let this happen. Um, with everything else that's changing, we do not need to lose any more ground. Oh, and I'll take your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate the presentation. Oh, can we'll, I say we'll something real quick? I'm sorry. Can I say something real quick about Mina? This is Mina. In, in one of our after-school programs, if you ever come there, Mina will be the first person to tell you she's the most important person in the center. So uh, our, this this center, we have two. The one on Ohio Avenue is between Mooberry and Livingston, and. Um, we are very proud to say in the last four years, we've had four young black men go on full ride scholarships to college. Um, all of them coming out of our, our music program, all of them with us since they were either in sixth or seventh grade. We're very proud of that. However, so we have a wall, and we actually have a specific scholarship fund for it. Um, there are no black girls on it. Um, I looked at our team and said, we got to change that. So we also have a leadership development program that you have to go through in order to be eligible for that. Um, the class that's going through it now, eight out of the 12 are black girls. And I'm going to tell you, Mina is going to be our first one up on that board. So I just had to give a shout out to Mina. Just because if any of you ever meet her, tell her, you know, I didn't diss her. You know, I, I, I'm, you know. All Can right. you do me a favor? Can you go to your first slide? Um, sure. And, and we're going to call on Dr. Dixon for his first question. Um, per your point about getting black girls on that wall, I applaud you. No, second slide, sorry. I applaud you for that slide because that's the tech studio at COSI where we teach, where we teach, where we teach black girls to code. So thank you for having oh, that. Oh, okay. Here. Good, 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 good. That's, go ahead, yeah, that's Dixon. part of Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, see? Uh, yeah. Can you share just a, a snapshot of the Ohio Avenue Center and what you offer there and some of the kids that you are addressing their needs and how you're addressing them through that program? Sure. Uh, Ohio Avenue, um, we have, uh, we serve 240 kids in that community. Um, those 240 kids actually attend 38 different schools. Uh, so um, we do not call it a drop-in center because it is not. We're, we're pretty intentional about everything we do. Um, Everybody has to, uh, uh, what, so what happens, they sign in and then they, they sign up for activities that they're going to participate in. When we first opened it, we, uh, it, it was cute. We thought, oh, it's after school, let's give a snack. Yeah, that lasted two weeks. Um, we needed to feed uh, these kids. So we have a fun food and fitness program where, where uh, kids eat. Actually, I, I share with people, um, one of the times, Ty, who was helping kids help prepare the meals for everybody because there's a lot of kids to cook for, uh, he once said, Mr. J, what is that? And Jay goes, oh, Ty, you've never seen lettuce? He goes, lettuce is in a ball? Sometimes we take things for granted that a lot of the kids that we serve don't have a clue about. They do not. And we often learn things from the kids that we serve. So all of them have to perform in, in our SPARK program, which we took out of Cincinnati. Um, it's, it's for reading, science, and math. They have to do that year round. It has our scores, our pre and post test from our scores. It's our second year of it, our great. Uh, no kid, not just our kids, but no kid can, can afford to get behind anymore. So everybody has to participate in SPARK, but then they can sign up. So we have 
uh, music lessons. So our drum ensemble has had over uh, 25 performances um, in the last year. Um, we, you can learn, we have guitar lessons, we have bass lessons, you can take piano lessons. So music, the arts are one part of it. Our art program is, is uh, pretty huge. Um, actually at the Adam board in the basement, that hand peg thing our kids made, it's huge. Uh, it, a lot of kids uh, uh, worked on that. Our soul bowls are sold like at, at Grange uh, in, in their lobby um, and, and some are in the, in the short north. Uh, we have a fitness program, we have a yoga uh, uh, and somatic services room. We have a dance program that is um, phenomenal. Actually, it's one of our graduates uh, who came back. He has actually performed on Broadway in The Lion King, and he was on So You Think You Can Dance, so he oversees that. And if any of you have been to our luncheon, uh, um, I, I know, Lisa, you were there. Michael, you were there. Uh, Tashi, you've been there. Yet. Uh, you've seen them dance, and they're, they're great. I'll tell you, the, one of the first times they dance, um, my son had come. He was at Purdue at the time, and he came home. He's sitting next to me, and uh, we're talking about kids who are just to express themselves it is great. Um, he turned to me and said, oh, my gosh, Dad, are you going to cry? I said, be quiet, Aaron. He's like, Dad, you see them all the time. And I turned to him and said, but if you knew where they came from, if you knew where they came from, you truly see the beauty in the creation of who they are and what they can become. Um, and, and, and we all have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of that. Uh, Councilwoman Tyson. Thank you. Thank you. I know, Dwayne, you really did move through your presentation pretty quickly. And for those of us who have the presentation in front of us, um, we have to read it. But there are some key components to this presentation. And that is, um, if you think about the people that you are serving, it is the majority of your clients you serve are considered at risk, reside in low SES neighborhoods, single parent households, live below the federal poverty rate. And a single and a significant number of our client population population has been exposed to trauma, including domestic violence, neighborhood violence, generational poverty, and or neglect. Yep. And I think that you think about the services you are providing, I mean, you just, you just spoke on a little bit of the importance of the arts to turn, you know, mm -hmm. the arts program that you're having and how that is going to help to turn that like, young life around because they are seeing themselves being, doing well in an area that then they can go on and do other work. But you also, just the counseling that's there, 561 kids get, you know, school connections, 535 five children, um, services in their home, encourage parent and other family member participation, and improve their family quality of life. 157 received trauma counseling for sexual abuse, physical abuse, tragic loss of a loved one, and or exposure to violence, helping them to build resilience and protective factors. I think we have to really highlight the work that you do. Appreciate and not minim you know, it's minimized somewhat by just moving through your presentation, because it, this commission, we have to be focused on um, who's doing good work in our community already and, um, and how do we continue to make sure that they're able to meet the needs of, the, for us, the young girls in our community. And so based upon these services you're providing, as well as I think of some of the services, children who witness violence, children of murder, parents and siblings, you know, um, you know, building a bright future for uh, juvenile court refer refer referrals, promises, survivors of sexual abuse. And so in this community, I mean, how many organizations are really focused on the work that you're talking about for our black girls? So that's number one. Mm -hmm. And then are you able for are you able to meet the demand um, within our community of girls that need your, these services? Yeah, I, I don't know what the numbers of how many there are. I don't know that there's very many at all that do it on an outreach basis. And, and that's critical because we have to meet the people we serve where they're at. Um, um, we have to. This, this is just, just critical. Um, uh, the, can we meet the demand? No. You know, you know it's really kind of sad. Uh, our comps program, Children of Murdered Parents and Sibling, uh, it, that should not have a wait list. But, but with uh, funding constraints at times it does. Um, our Promises program always has a way. You know, I, I, let me say something about Promises too, particularly because something happened at Ohio Avenue, uh, truly, I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 are people of color, but um, it probably is 100, I don't know that, that there. But 
Our Promises program that we run out there, and that's our program for survivors of sexual abuse, it has an individual, a family, and a group component. Let me share something that came from that, young, that group of young black girls in that program. Um, and we all think we're so smart. You know, we have bachelor's, master's, PhDs, license, whatever, letters. Uh, one of the groups that was leaving, um, so we have a celebration at the end of their treatment. So they, 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 and more than half of the people that come into this program, by the way, do not come because of being a survivor of sexual abuse. They come because they were a bad kid in school. So that label already started. It isn't until we develop a therapeutic relationship with them that then we're able to start to look at some of the traumatic events that have occurred in their life, which led to, unfortunately, to me, schools are, are, are a symptom. They're not the problem. It's a safer place for them to act out a lot of stuff. So unfortunately, that's where you end up seeing some of them. But at the end of one of the uh, 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 group programs, uh, the, the young women were talking about, and we're talking, they're about from seven, this group was a young, we, we divided by groups, it was like seven to ten year olds. Um, they were talking about how the very first group, even though they were in individual counseling, they were addressing it with their, their, their therapist, um, to come to group for the first time, even though you knew you are going to be with other people who have experienced the same thing, was terrifying. It was, ter it's critical. That group component to that program is critical, but it was terrifying to them. So they were reflecting on that in their celebration when they were graduating from the program um, because all those emotions were coming back and, and what they have had achieved. And it is their achievement, by the way. Uh, and they said, you know something? We would like to write letters to the next group to let them know it's going to be okay. That's what comes from some of the young people that we serve, that truly care about others who they know are going to go through the same things that they do. And we have to celebrate. Those. I think it's the smartest thing our agency ever did, so uh, uh, is listen to them, and that's always been a part of our program since then, and none of us can take credit for that. Right. So one last follow-up question to Councilwoman Tyson's question. Is the, is the capacity issue uh, a funding problem, just throw more money on it, or do we need to train more community workers? Are these people out there that can service it, but we just have to hire them? Where, where's the, or is it all of the above? It's all of the above. Okay. Um, I will tell you, anybody in the, in, in the uh, nonprofit world will say we need more money. I know everybody gets tired of that. But part of it, we also have to get smarter about uh, bringing money in from outside, too. So, you know, we, we're working with several organizations because of our association with National Crittenden to do so, um, a, a, as well as some other uh, uh, ventures that we need to. Um, everybody's got to step up to the plate. But there is a shortage of licensed workers. There is a shortage in this, and particularly licensed workers who are people of color. So I'm glad you that's brought that a, that's up. A very, that, very that's very critical. We heard that. Sorry to cut you up. We heard that yesterday or two days ago, loud and clear, in the listening sessions where they're talking about how many security guards they might have in the school, but they don't have enough counselors. And so the question right. is, are these counselors out there to be hired, and do they reflect the population to whom they need to serve, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, I was talking to Larry James one time, and he said, Dwayne, well, I want to know what's the racial makeup of your, your organization. Um, uh, we're, we're pretty diverse. 75% um, of our licensed workers are uh, people of color. So um, I, I think you have to at least uh, uh, try to, I, and that's, we, we had a started a group. You have to be intentional about this, folks. You really do. It's about the, uh, the, it's about the recruitment, the hiring, and retention of people of color. And you have to be intentional about it. When we first started that group years ago, um, I, call, I named the group. It was my group. And we called it Mo Better Minorities. Sorry, it was... Uh, Kind of off a of Mo Better Blues. I don't know. I was stealing. Okay, Mr. It Lee. Was <laughs> <laughs> okay, Spike. <laughs> that was a great movie. Anyway, uh, we. <laughs> I'm a do the right thing kind of guy myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. We started with that one. No, we started with that one. Those were the two. Those were the final two. Okay, great. I actually, okay. I, I serve on the United Way board. At least sitting there thinking, why is he up there? What is he yeah. doing? I said one last question, but I do want to respect our, our, our commissioner. So, Sergeant Ali, you got the last. Ali, you got the last question. 
just have one question. How are the, the kids referred to your program? Mm -hmm. And is it something that the police can assist you with? Um, I'm also a part of the Teens and Police uh, Service Academy, which we go into the middle schools and um, work with at-risk youth on how to have a better relationship with police officers. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those kids would also be a good fit for the program. So I was just curious how that all worked out. Yeah, anyone uh, can refer. We get a lot of our referrals from the school systems. We have a huge contract with Southwest City Schools. We've always worked with Columbus City Schools, so a lot come from there. A lot of come from juvenile court. We have uh, contracts with them. Um, they come from churches. They come from parents. They come, it really doesn't matter. They come from other agencies. Um, particularly when agencies get referrals of people who they know aren't going to go to office-based counseling. So then uh, they'll come through us. We have a program uh, with FCCS. We get referrals from their, them as well. Um, anybody can refer, and we would be more than happy to, to partner uh, okay. with the Columbus Police Department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. have our timer here so we can stay <laughs> on track we practice this thank first we want to thank you cam and i would like to thank everyone for having us and inviting us today um, as um, miss frazier mentioned my name is denisha washington i'm the clinical coordinator for the family support program at big lots behavioral health and cam and i are two um, black girls that serve as clinical coordinators in that um, department out of there are four of us total in that department black girls so I just want to talk a little bit about the Family Support Program. So as Dwayne mentioned earlier, so um, the Family Support Program, while we are an outpatient service provider, we provide, we're a full-time um, child maltreatment program that we are co-located in the Center for Family Safety and Healing due to that um, prevention and intervention services for um, children of maltreatment and family violence. We serve youth ages three to 18 years old, boys and girls, um, in a variety of programming. So I won't go through all of it that's on the list, but um, we see youth that have been exposed to sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, domestic violence, as well as childhood traumatic grief. And most of our services do happen on site. However, we do have a small portion. We have one full-time um, therapist who provides full-time community-based work. So similar to as Dwayne was talking about, that is our version of outreach in that small population. Um, however, we do have some outpatient staff that also do go in the community as well. Um, so as I'll talk later in GAPS, we do know that that's one of ours with providing most of our services on site. Um, thanks, Cam. And as I reflect here on the ACEs, um, as I'm sure most of you are aware of in this room, what we also have learned as well is that um, with this study, we learned that African-American girls, black girls are at increased risk for experiencing multiple ACEs, and we know marginalized populations also um, have um, a higher rate of child maltreatment, and black girls are three times more likely to experience child abuse and neglect based on some of the information we've learned, um, and it was solidified, rather, through the ACEs study. And we also know that our black girls have a history of more externalizing behaviors, which was um, noted a little a few minutes ago um, in the prior presentation. And so for us, which Cam will talk about a little bit more in depth, those aren't the girls that might be getting you know, OSU and pomegranate for psychiatric hospitalizations. Those are the young women that are being expelled or suspended. So they might miss getting referred to an organization like the Family Support Program because that child maltreatment piece might not be that presenting problem that we are seen and what's being noted. Along with that, we know nationally um, one in 10 children have experienced three or more ACEs. So that category puts them already at especially high risk. And if we look at especially Ohio, one of, um, you know, one of the states listed, 
we know that one in seven children here have experienced three or more ACEs. So we already know we have a lot of youth that are at especially high risk. And with that, specific to our black girls, one in three black non-Hispanic children have experienced two to eight ACEs. So if three is especially high risk, then if we have two to eight ACEs, where is that placing our young black girls? Compared to one in five in white non-Hispanic children. So for family support program, um, the initial data that we had was that from January to June of 2018, we had 32, that's okay, we had 32 girls that had been provided services within our program, 32 black girls. So again, I'll talk about that in gaps because clearly that is a gap for our service line. Um, and then additional information over the course of the year from August 2017 to August 2018, we had out of 668 total visits. So a visit includes that initial assessment or um, um, one session so that they linked with us for at least a diagnostic intake. 668 of those, we had 51 that were black girls ages 11 to 18. So again, we have work to do and you know try to address some of these gaps. That's why we're really thankful to be here today to start to talk about some of those pieces. So moving to the gaps um, with challenges and opportunities, we already know, you know, as I mentioned before, black youth are three times more likely to be victims of child abuse and neglect. However, we are not the group that's three times more likely to be linked with service providers in the community. So that's already one of the gaps. You know, once this has been disclosed, how are we then meeting those needs? You know, even going back to mandated reporting pieces, how are we doing what we need to do on our end? Um, Family Support Program is a multidisciplinary team that has, we are fortunate to have a psychiatrist, um, a psychologist who is a black girl. So we are very fortunate to have that on site, as well as master's level, independently licensed social workers and licensed social workers and counselors. So really joining together to try to address some of these pieces um, with psychiatric follow-up as well as psychological testing that can also inform um, IEP processes and, and school as well to make that connection from that trauma lens. Um, additionally, um, we also know that there's a distrust of going to seek out mental health services. And I think that gets exacerbated when you have an outpatient setting. Um, I, I do think what works for Children's Hospital is that Children's Hospital. A lot of families go there, whether it's for a broken arm or dental clinic, but there still is that gap of knowing even that we exist and to reduce that stigma and distrust of going to Children's Hospital for getting your teeth cleaned as well as being able to go there and get child maltreatment services through um, Big Lots Behavioral Health Department. Um, one of the pieces that Cam will talk about more later, but I just want to touch on, you know, the recruitment and retention of women of color, people of color, continues to be a piece that Nationwide Children's Hospital has focused on and continues to work through. But definitely right now, that still is a gap when we talk about independently licensed and licensed providers. So opportunities, some opportunities we definitely feel like, you know, that culturally relevant, culturally competent services that's under that trauma-informed umbrella, that culture of not so much what is wrong with you, but what happened to you. If we can start the dialogue there, because a lot of our young black girls, it's more of what's wrong with you? Why are you acting this way? Why do you have an attitude versus what has happened to you? So that continues to be opportunity for us as well as uh, in our local community. Um, additionally, the National Child Traumatic Stress network has listed like empirically supported um, evidence-based programs that are culturally relevant. And I've listed a few up here. Two of these, the trauma-focused CBT as well as EMDR, we currently provide in family support program. The last one is really out of California, integrative treatment of um, complex trauma for adolescents. That really is one that as Dwayne mentioned on the VAWA, we're waiting for our VOCA money. That is part of what we've asked for in the, um, through the Victim of Crime Compensation Act to help um, get us going on that and get some funding for that as we have for our victim trauma treatment groups that we offer. Um, and then again, the Nationwide Children's Hospital looking to connect with universities and through practicums. We currently work with Ohio State University for our social work programming, as well as Capital and UD for the counselor intern program. So the needs to improve quality of life for our black girls. So continuing to do 
things like this, to reach out and partner. Um, as Dwayne talks, I was taken aback because we don't even know what each other are doing in the community. We are providing trauma services, and I want to answer your question even before you ask it. We cannot meet the whole need. And so partnering <laughs> together, I think, you know, when we have a wait list or families that we know can't come in, how do we do a better job as social service agencies not to have a turf war to say, okay, we might not be able, but maybe you can because we are all in this together. Um, and then um, I think that'll help reduce barriers to linkage for families. Um, the next part, again, increase awareness of the culture of trauma, not just child maltreatment, but even poverty being the culture of trauma. You know, as we talked about this, and we know um, families of lower SES backgrounds and who are in poverty struggle with even being able for um, anyone to understand that impact. I might not have been physically abused, and yet look what I have to deal with on an everyday basis just to get up and get out the door. Um, and then increasing awareness around resiliency factors. We know, um, and Ms. Frazier came to help us some years ago when we had the SAMHSA grant for dialectical behavior therapy, and she was instrumental in talking to us about how we understand resiliency and research that's coming out about our black girls that have this within themselves and how can we continue to um, kind of mitigate through resiliency and mentoring and things like that in the community for black girls to other black girls. So that's a little bit about the family support program. I'm going to turn it over to Cam for the school-based programming. Thank you. Okay, so a really quick overview of the um, school-based program. As Denisha mentioned, I'm the clinical coordinator. Um, this is our purpose statement and our goals. I won't go over them in detail, but really focus on our goal of decreasing the gap of access to care. So we know that there are lots of barriers um, for children in general to get the mental health care that they need, but specifically when we talk about marginalized populations and black girls, both Dwayne and Denisha shared some of those barriers. Um, so that is our focus. A couple years ago, Nationwide Children's Children's Hospital did a um a deep dive and identify that working in schools will, you know, kind of help with decreasing those barriers and meeting kids where they're at. Really quick overview of our program. Um, we partner with about 50 schools in the county. Um, we have the most buildings in Columbus City Schools. We partner with about 39 Columbus City Schools. Um, we are also in um, Bexley School District, Canal Winchester, and Kip Academy. Um, I have about 36 therapists, um, all master level clinicians who go out. Um, unfortunately, only about five of those are um, diverse. Um, are black folks and um, two of them are girls. So definitely um, to reinforce that there's, there's a gap. Um, there's a need for um, more master level clinicians in this area. Just wanna kinda um, do a quick overview of what we do in a school. So we um, have a multi-tier delivery system that matches and mirrors the positive behavior intervention support um, strategy that um, most schools use, including Columbus City Schools. So what we do um, is at tier one, universal prevention level, we do a lot of prevention in the schools. And this is not a service that you have to qualify for. The goal is to impact school climate and make some shifts in the school climate. We do some um, with signs of suicide and working with the Center for Suicide Prevention and Research, a lot of suicide prevention, but not us going in and doing it, but training the teachers, training the classrooms, um, so that the teachers and, and the leaders in the school feel comfortable in being able to address some of those suicidal concerns with students. We also implement the Pax Good Behavior Game um, in our elementary schools. And what really, again, is teacher-led, um, and it helps teachers, and we do some consultation, really teach kids resiliency. Teachers go to school, and they learn how to teach math. They learn how to teach reading and all of those things, but there's not a lot of curricula that really focuses on how do you teach resiliency. Um, and so we, we work with the schools to do that. And then at the Tier 2 level, um, we just do targeted prevention where we work with kids who are not yet reach full impairment, but they're at risk. I um, mean, we do some social skills and um, coping strategy groups. And then at the tier three level is where we do our individual and family therapy. And our goal is really to impact three systems, the individual, the family, and the school. So we like to have two to three contacts with one of those um, three uh, systems. So looking at outcomes, at tier one, we're in 100 classrooms in the county. We're doing classroom observations. We're providing feedback on whether or not it's a nurturing or treatment, um, I'm sorry, a trauma-informed environment. Um, we also track data. So we've been able to decrease by 60% in the classrooms that we're in, um, in attentive behaviors. And at least one school, we've been able to decrease um, the discipline referrals by 50%. 
for SOS, we, and that this data is a little bit outdated. I believe we're, we've been in about 70 schools in Franklin County. Um, and with that data, we've done tons of screenings. And so for the 16, 17 school year in Columbus City Schools, we did 600 risk assessments. So that 600 kids who may have been endorsing suicidal behavior, we might not have known otherwise about that. That doesn't mean all 600 were hospitalized. They may have been referred to other services, but there was some concern that indicated we needed to do a risk assessment. At Tier 2, we do some pre and post assessments um, to figure out if the students are acquiring the skills that we're trying to teach them. And then at Tier 3, we have a host of outcome measures. Um, primarily, we're looking at treatment, treatment goals, the frequency, intensity, and duration of the referral behaviors. And we like to see that go down and move the needle a little bit. School data. We look at attendance, we look at academic progress, um, and we're looking at behaviors. Um, and I see Dr. Dixon here, so I think he's happy to hear we use Ohio skills. <laughs> so we definitely look at some of the problem and functioning areas, as well as perception of care surveys. Um, we want to know how they feel about the services they're receiving from children. So, some data and concerns. Um, in my program, just my program, we saw 936 kids last school year. 213 of them were black girls. One of the things that um, Dwayne highlighted, which I love, is the work by um, Dr. Monique Morris. And she really talks about that whole thing of, you know, the school to prison pipeline specifically for black girls. This whole idea that girls are getting suspended and expelled because of their attitude and not really focusing on what's happening to you, getting to the bottom of what are the factors that kind of are causing you to kind of come to school and feel this way. One of the things I also wanted to share is that black kids are disproportionately diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, specifically girls. They're being misdiagnosed. It's being diagnosed as ODD when it's anxiety. And I have a little bit of personal experience. I have an 18-year-old that even as a therapist for a lot of her life, I'm labeling this as willful behavior. It was anxiety. Mm -hmm. So once we can correctly label what's going on, we're able to provide the correct intervention and see better outcomes. One and like there's a lot of anecdotal information, but there's a lot of research that supports a lot of what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that was really, I don't want to say surprising, we're not surprised that black girls are resilient, right? But that's because they've had to be. And some of that research was supported by the Kerwin Institute study in 2011. Overall, black girls have really resilient attitudes, but it's because they have to, because they're not linked to services. They're not trusting of services. Um, the other thing is that if you're connected with a, Afri a community that's primarily African American or you have really great supports, that's a protective factor. So we haven't talked a lot about our black girls that live in suburbs because there's some struggle there for black girls who don't have that connection and they're struggling with self-image. So overall, what we know is that black girls have good self-identity. They reject the mainstream idea of beauty. They might struggle with some of the subculture ideas of beauty, um, but it's a look, the increased risk is when they're in community communities where they don't have that connection. Um, we talked about the disproportionate rate of black girls being suspended. That's increased in suburban districts. So kind of looking through some of the resources, we find that black girls are suspended disproportionately overall, but we see an increase in suburban districts. So wanting to call attention to that. Um, and then talking about um, the gaps, we talked about the workforce sh uh, shortage is there. I participated in a lot of strategies with Nationwide Children's Hospital, including going to HBCUs to try and recruit. So we desperately want to be able to have our staff reflect the populations that we serve. Um, I think that we could do better in connecting with the community. So I think that's some of the gaps. We've done some stuff to decrease the gap in access to care by doing school-based stuff. We have the Healthy Neighborhood, Healthy Family Initiative to connect with communities closest to us, but we can also do a little bit more. So some of the, the opportunities I think are um, just platforms like this to kind of talk about the gaps, being transparent yeah. about what those gaps are. Mm -hmm. um, also, leadership opportunities for our young black girls, career exploration, um, and just connecting with women who are successful so that they not just see it, but have someone to kind of help them with that blueprint and guide them through it. 
Um, and of course, increased funding, definitely want to throw that out there. I think um, the infrastructure really supports a reactive approach, and so definitely um, there's funding, could be more, but we have funding and reimbursement for treatment services, but we could definitely do more in the terms of wellness and how do we do um, preventive work, so. Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> I, I, I definitely have to ask one question. Um, a, a lot of the recent literature um, is showing us that our girls are really involved with suicide in a way that they haven't been before. Mm -hmm. And even though the percentage is small, it's yeah. rising. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had ideas about why you think that is? I think it's a couple of reasons. I want to point to the ACEs study, so we know that that increases risk, and then when you have the intersectionality of being um, a, a black person and then being a girl, you have that increased risk. Then we also, we talk about those gaps in the access to care, um, that you know it, it's not there. So I think that could be some of the reasons why, I don't know if you want to add. I think another piece where we've also talked about it, Nationwide Children's Hospital, is really the political climate also yeah. um, is affecting. We've also heard a lot more um, young people who have talked about just being scared, whether it's related to immigration, whether it's related to, you know, Nationwide Children's also has a program for transgender youth. So again, those are pieces where we've heard and there's a higher correlation of um, suicidal ideation for those particular groups also, some of which also include black girls. And I think as we look further in the data, there's just an overall increase in suicide in general. It, yes. So, the, you know, so, yes. so all groups, black girls and white girls, yeah. et cetera, is increasing. But so. I will highlight for, for um, black kids, it is rising a little bit higher. It so is. you oh, see absolutely. it, and, but it then is. you see a, a bigger yeah. increase for, for black kids. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's getting higher for yeah. black girls. Yeah. Dr. Quinn. Yes. I just wanted to amplify the with regard to the challenge around children of color, particularly African-American adolescents, younger children mm -hmm. who are expressing suicidal thoughts or behaviors, the focus tends to be on base rates of suicide. So because the base rates of completed suicides among our population are, young, are lower, the focus tends to be elsewhere on Correct. populations that are actually dying by suicide. Mm -hmm. But the literature is clear that particularly for young girls that express suicidal ideation, the long, lifelong occurrence of suicide is much greater and the quality of life tends to be much lower. Mm -hmm. And there are studies that are showing that African American boys as well are actually dying by yes. suicide at younger ages, mostly by strangulation. Yes. But these things do not rise because of the base rate issue. Mm -hmm. um, a comment and a question. Um, comment, um, Denisha, thank you very much for talking about um, unifying resources. Again, in the listening sessions, we heard expert after expert talk about the suite of resources they have and how they're doing and impacting the community. And one after the other, they would say, how do we get together? Yes. And so it would be really great for the commission, at least one of the outcomes is uh, a, a kind of um, asset mapping of these resources that are out mm -hmm. there and compiling them in one database that's free and accessible so people can, can, can map that. Um, and, and the second point was, uh, was a question for, for Cam. Um, it's interesting, you mentioned that, that in, in suburbs or mm -hmm. you know, richer areas, if you will, um, girls are, are being expelled or getting, to mm -hmm. black girls are getting expelled more at a higher frequency. And, and what do you th why do you think that is? Is it one, um, is it right, just straight racism? Two, is it they're trying to pretend they're kind of not affluent mm -hmm. and, 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 and trying to be, I don't know, I'm, what, yeah. what are your thoughts around it? I, that's I think, interesting. I think it's some unconscious and conscious bias. I think, you know, that if um, you don't have people in the district that are paying attention or can relate or kind of understand that that creates some bias. And so the behavior, the attitude is perceived as insubordinate. And so, you know, and it's also symptom presentation. I talked about anxiety and how a lot of times that gets misdiagnosed. And so depending on your culture, it's not okay to be vulnerable, um, depending how you grew, grew up. And so if you're struggling with the curriculum and the teacher calls on you, um, my, a lot of kids are not going to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that, or I didn't get that. It might come across as, F you, I'm not doing that. And so, and realistically, no one's getting to, to the problem. And just to add a little bit of antidote, I, I live in a suburb. 
and I, I do it in a district form for my CCS. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, it's legal. I send my kids to Columbus City Schools. I have two graduate Sakai's and they're at Morehouse and Spelman because um, I want I continue to want them to have that connection um, and I have a, a junior. So living in a suburb, I, I know how important it is for kids to feel connected yeah. to their culture and I choose to send my kids to Columbus mm -hmm. City Schools. I think it's also as we talked before about staff that look like them. Mm -hmm. So finding someone to connect with and identify and talk to when you're having an issue. I think that is um, less than in the suburb areas. Not to say that they aren't trying, but I do think that that's a piece. If there's no one that looks like me, then who do I go to mm -hmm. if I'm struggling? I have, I'm sorry, can I add real quick to um, Dr. Um, sure, okay. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the work you're doing and for this presentation. Um, uh, two questions for you, if I may. Um, the first is, uh, in another life, I worked at the Children's Defense Fund, um, whose founder uh, was Mary, is Marion Wright Edelman, mm -hmm. um, who, of course, has written extensively and worked extensively in the cradle-to-prison pipeline. I really appreciate um, you flagging the importance of that and the significant disparities that exist across the state. In 2016, the state legislature uh, passed, uh, a anti oh, I'm sorry, passed a truancy bill to try and minimize or at least decrease mm -hmm. the criminalization through truancy. Um, have you noticed any changes in all your experience thus far in schools with truancy being criminalized and the disciplinary processes that are in place? The second question, um, in my job now, I get to work with 65 nonprofits, many of whom are working in um, schools across the county. Um, how much engagement do you have with other nonprofits um, in the community, communities and schools, mm -hmm. Directions for Youth, City, or so mm -hmm. on and so forth? So your first question was related to House Bill 410. Um, I think at, at some buildings, we definitely are engaged in the intervention piece or, around truancy. So we, we have opportunities um, in other, you know, other places we're not. Um, I had someone share with me, and I don't have direct insight into this, but it sounds like, again, that some of the suburban districts are struggling with that a little bit. Um, but we're definitely available as a resource to kind of get to the bottom of, like, why kids are truant, if there's, um, you know, something that we can do as far as, you know, figuring out their basic needs, connecting them with mental health resources. Um, so we're definitely... Um, a resource, but I also think that a lot of schools are still trying to figure it out. I believe it's the second school year where they've been operating under House Bill 14. Um, and then your second question, we love to partner. So I love city year communities and schools um, just because we, we operate on kind of billing. We're master, we're, we're therapists, we're clinicians. There are things that some of our partners um, can do um, that it's more effective um, to partner with them. So we love to partner. We're in buildings with other mental health professionals. Um, the ranch directions for youth, and we love to partner so we can figure out how can we attack um, some of the issues together. Thank you. I don't necessarily have a, a question, but um, more of a comment. Um, I appreciate some of the comments that you said concerning um, what some of our students have to go through um, at, at home. And so recently, you know, Schools report cards came out mm -hmm. and Columbus City School received an F. And I heard a lot of backlash, not only to the district, but to some of the teachers. And at The Ohio State University, I worked in the College of Education and I placed a lot of students in Columbus City Schools. Mm -hmm. um, and not many of them were um, students of color. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're not being taught how to deal with some of the stuff mm -hmm. that are minority or students of color at that age are dealing with at home. And so I think it's important for what the work and the charge that this commission is going to be doing, um, looking at uh, that particular population. Um, but I think that's something that we really got to focus on um, as, you know, we continue to do our research is that we have these um, white females mm -hmm. that are going out into Columbus City Schools um, that are not trained to deal with some of the stuff mm -hmm. that Dwayne and you guys are talking about that goes on um, in their household in order for them to successfully pass, which is why Columbus City Schools probably received the grade that they did. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all very much.
Cutler is our uh, researcher for um, a, a good portion of the work that this commission is going to do. And um, she wanted to give us an update on uh, how the research is going. Okay, so I'll be as brief as possible. Um, we have been making uh, good progress. We've uh, completed two listening sessions, as uh, Councilmember Tyson mentioned. We have one listening session left, uh, and this is a very important listening session because it's with the girls. Uh, so on the 27th, we'll be listening to um, we'll be listening to to girls tell their stories. Uh, so we do encourage the members of the commission to attend and also to invite other girls to attend. Uh, we're also in the almost final phase of um, the revisions for the surveys, so I'll be connecting with, um, with the chairs and we're gonna finalize that soon and we're hoping to implement the survey um, in October. And the survey actually covers a lot of the important things that have been brought up via uh, the experts' presentations. We are asking questions that will allow us to calculate their A, sc a scores. Um, we're asking questions about uh, their economic and um, employment experiences, as well as Dr. Smooth gave some feedback to increase the extent to which we ask about their sexuality. So we're gonna be covering a lot of the things that we have discussed in this forum. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. And once we implement the survey, we will be bugging you to uh, bug girls to complete the survey because the, the higher our survey response rate, the more we can um, draw some, some generalizable conclusions. So we do encourage you to participate actively in that part of the process. Since I don't want to overwhelm you and we are pressed for time, those are the two updates that I'll give you for today. And <laughs> I, I will, um, I'll update you more next month. How about that? All right, thank you. Some thank questions, you, a couple of questions, Dr. Well, a couple of questions, quick questions. Come from Kim. I'm excited about the work that you're doing. Can you mm -hmm. share with the commission whether or not the young girls that will participate in the survey will receive any incentives? No, they will not receive an incentive. Um, we discussed the, the possibility of that earlier in the in the in the phase of the project, um, and we decided against it. Um, so, no, they will not be receiving an incentive, but they will be telling their stories and impacting policy in the future. So we are hoping that we can um, impress upon them uh, the importance of that. But yes, there is some some concern about recruitment because of the fact that there's no incentive. And also that is why we need you to bug the girls that you know and you know spread a survey in your sphere of influence because we don't have that natural incentive. But yes, we did think and deliberate a lot about that. Great. Um, Thank and, you. And, and one of the questions, well, why don't we have an incentive? No, sorry. 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 Oh. Yes. Oh, sorry, so. Um, right, well, I push for no incentive. Um, primarily because one of the civic responsibilities of shaping how our community is to function is to figure out how you give of yourself. How do you use your voice to create change? The only way we get to teach our girls how to do that is to give them the opportunity to do it and to make that the incentive, that your voice creates the change that's needed. Um, I'll give you a really good yesterday example. Um, we, Rises to Rise has a mural that's called Placing Black Girls at Promise, and right now it is in our public libraries. So right now it's at Shepherd Library. And um, once or twice a month, the Rises to Rise think tank girls go to have conversation with the girls at the library about what does it mean to place black girls at promise? And do you see yourself in that mural? There were 14 girls who were, um, uh, the girls had got to say that they were gonna come. And then the girls said to the think tank girls, so what you gonna give us? 
you, you got candy, what you got? And uh, the think tank girl said, just conversation. So they said, well, we're not coming. So then I ran out to the dollar store, bought a ton of stuff. By the time I got back, the girls were so engaged in the conversation, they didn't even know the candy was there. So part of what the work has to be about is showing our girls the power of their voice, the power of intention, the power that they have within them already without a bus card, without a Kroger card, without some kind of gift card, that they have power right in themselves to change what's going on, and they don't always need a gift to get them there. So I pushed really hard, truthfully, for no kind of incentive. Now, when the girls, because some of this will be happening in places, there will be things for the girls to eat or snack on but no gift. Um, we can give high school girls community service credit for participating. We can definitely give them hours for that, but I was really adamant about the fact that the only way our girls are gonna understand the power of their voice and the power of their thought is to be able to have that opportunity to do it, so. I would like to say that I definitely appreciate your responses, but I would like for the commission to be aware of that for young women to participate, we have to be open that some of them do not have resources. For young women in our community where they do not have the resources to buy a box of diapers, we want to hear from them. Some of them will choose, do I buy diapers or do I hop on the bus? So I agree with everything that you say, but I want us to be mindful if it's the commission, other organizations that want to be a part of this, can we all come together to say, for young girls that want to participate, we will at least help you with transportation. And that is something that we've committed to at the Center for Healthy Families for the pregnant parenting teens that want to participate, we will get you there. That's great. So thank you. And, and I just want to add that, that, that what, 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 what both of you all are saying are, are valid, because what you're talking about, that's not an incentive. So, right, so right, right. you're you're spot on. You're yes. spot on regarding incentives, but we have to make we this process accessible for yes. for this for the yes. girls. So absolutely. Yes. And we did Thank say you. transportation. I mean, we did not want to make transportation an obstacle for anyone coming, and so we've already said if we need to figure, we need to make sure that we want to hear from all girls, and so we know that all girls will not have the resources to get to, to either one if we have to be at a specific place to have this conversation on next Thursday. But even when we're looking at the. Um, as we're doing the surveys. The surveys, yes, we'll have a location for girls to come to, but also we will not, all, all the girls will not be surveyed together. Mm -hmm. We'll have to go to the girls who are in the juvenile justice system, we gotta go there. To the girls that are in, you know, if we need to have <clears throat> hearing from our um, hearing and um, vision impaired, that we have to go where they are because they'll have the resources to do that. So we are prepared because we wanna hear from all girls and we don't want to be exclusionary because then we're not going to be able to help the needs of, needs of the community. And so in um, your case, Tashia, if it is about transportation, then we've got to work, figure out how to help you get your girls to where they need to be. And anyone else who made it clear, I was just talking to another a person who's at the event on Tuesday, and she was saying she could, she's going to bring a number of girls, but some of the girls will have transportation, and we're working on that because that cannot be an obstacle. And for those of you who have organizations that are working with girls, we definitely know that your whether you are in um, sororities, other groups, that you guys, you guys normally figure out how to get people where they need to be. We're not telling you to bring you know, 15 girls. If you could just bring four girls, that's gonna represent what you, the people that you're working with, but we wanna hear their voices. We're also discussing having the survey online so that we can um, increase yeah. ease, ease of access. Right. So. Great. Yes. And how long is it gonna take a girl to complete the survey? So that is also um, something that we have been trying to balance um, because you know a lot, there are a lot of issues and um, and we're trying to cover as much as we can. But as it stands, it's about sixty questions. Um, so it will take. Uh, it depends on your reading level, I, I suppose. But uh, anywhere from twenty to to thirty minutes. So it's it's not. We tried to keep it, you know to the bare minimum, but even the bare minimum still ended up 
getting us around 60. And we have, we have one survey for younger girls, and we have another survey for older, slightly older girls, in an attempt to, to balance that as well. Um, can, can I ask, ask a question about the, the third hearing? You mentioned it's the one for, for, for young girls, for black yes. girls. Um, remind me of what our target number um, that we have to reach, and, and do you have a sense of how many we have registered so far? Uh, how much help can we bring to make sure you have the, the population size you need? Yes, Jill. I'm there, sorry. There, so there the, are 60 girls who have registered already. Okay. okay. And the and hope target. is is yeah. that we can... I know Priscilla would love to have at least 200 girls there. Okay. I, too many young ladies in the building and that we are out of space. And so that is the goal. And so what we are expecting and anticipating is that you all will all partner with us, even those of you who are not part of the commission, that when the information and the link is available and for Thursday, that you will continue to talk to those young girls and you would encourage them to get there. You would encourage them if they need assistance. If we have young ladies who are deaf or blind and need assistance, we gave up my phone number, 614-546-7815. Please let me know. We will make sure the services are available for them to attend that day. If there's any special accommodation that is needed so that we can work with the health department in terms of the building aesthetics, um, we want to ensure of that. We will even work with young ladies if they want to do some kind of video um, taping, because one of the things that we've talked about, if we have a young lady who wants to do something on her phone and do a video recording, and send it in, we will accept that. And so we are really trying to make sure that we are as deliberate and intentional as possible. The other thing I want to raise for this group is to remind yourselves that in this project, whether you call it a research, a study, or anything else, we want to make sure that we're not minimizing what we think young girls can do. So I want to caution this group when we think of the numbers, <clears throat> when we think of numbers game. 60 may seem like a lot, but we, that means we're assigned a measurement to what young people can do. And again, this is why we're existing to make sure that we don't do that. Each one of those questions will be vetted and made sure that it is important and that it's going to register the information to help us garner what we need. And so unfortunately, there are a lot of those things. The other thing to think about, too, is that in raising young ladies' voices and making sure that we get the girls to the table from a research perspective, one of the things we have to also be very zealous of, when you put a final product together, it is important that there is some integrity in the process that you move through. And so we make sure that we are looking at what is being asked, how it's being asked, when it's being asked, what time are these sessions start. We can't do it all, but we certainly make sure that we try to do the most. And it's part of your role is to help us hold ourselves accountable and to hold each other accountable. So on Thursday, I expect everybody to have somebody in the room, um, if not two or three of somebody, so that we can ensure of that. Um, we will try to make sure that it is comfortable, it is as accommodating as possible. When the link comes out, we will be pushing that link to you on a weekly basis saying, hey, make sure you get it out. Um, it will be a survey that is designed that if a young lady decides that I've done enough and I don't want to do anymore, it will still send, unlike some surveys, so it will not have that stop gap where you have to do all of them. Um, there will be probably some questions that they may have to answer, but as soon as we're finished with that, Dr. Butler, myself, and Jill, we're working to make sure that all of these pieces fuse together. We're always open for your suggestions, comments, feedback, support. Um, and anything that you think we can do to ensure that we get young black girls to the table, let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a possibility for a social media presence of some sort with millennials? Um, if we're talking about a link um, to present it, because like I know like my capacity is, is much larger to fill a room with an uh, event that is private and invited only, but also um, specific to a certain demographic. So if we could do that with a link, that could also get you know the outlier. Yes, so, um, so especially with the survey, so with the listening session, um, that has a specific location. But with the survey, especially, we're hoping to get a lot of social media sharing on that one. Um, so yes, we will, we will have the link, and we will send it to all of you so that you can share it, share it with your sphere of influence. Yeah. Awesome.
Thank you um, for each of the um, commissioners who certainly um, stayed past six o'clock and we're sorry, but hopefully that um, you, obviously you stayed here because I think of just the, of the information that was shared and I do appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the, um, the presentations and certainly the questions that you've asked that um, continues to make this commission um, We'll make sure that this makes this commission one that hopefully is being inclusive to you and allowing you to ask the questions that you need to ask for us to be able to gather the information that is so important. I want to thank, I thank the presenters that share their information today. And again, I'm always very appreciative of you. There are flyers on the back table that will, um, for the, the last listening session for girls to share, or for girls to share in terms of um, um, in this particular portion of it, and then of course with the focus groups and the survey. So anything else for the good of the order? Saying that? Thank you so much.